Welcome to day three. We have got, we've got an instrument that is pretty much together. The body and the top have been joined and carved and routed and it looks like a guitar. And the neck has a fretboard that has been glued in place and hopefully, hopefully is aligned properly and is good to go. Today, today is going to be the fun bit. We've just been toying with you up to this point. Uh, building a guitar neck is basically the most important part of a build. Uh, yes, the layout of the frets is, is absolutely essential, and if you get a pre-slotted fretboard and glue it in the right place, you'll be sorted, that's, that's not a problem. But uh, installing those frets uh, is then the next stage of, uh, of craziness and uh, it's something that can, that can go wrong. So I'll walk you through that process. We're going to put inlays in. We're then going to um, thickness the headstock down so there's a little bit of a break angle. And finally, carve the neck. And uh, now that I said, that actually sounds like rather a lot of work. So let's get on. All right, I would normally just bandsaw all this excess off, but uh, seeing as we don't have uh, access to bandsaws in this limited tool build, uh, well, spokeshave, spokeshave it is. I had to think about that one. Okay, so where the plane can't go, I've removed with the spoke shave. Okay, I'm going just so I can just feel a little bit of a ledge there. Okay, so with the biggest chisel possible, lay it on the flat surface. And then I'm paring away. And that's bringing it flush. And this way I run no risk. Well, <laughs> there's always risk. I'm running less risk of changing the geometry of the neck. We're happy with that shape. Rinse and repeat. You see that even when I'm doing this, I'm holding the blade at an angle, so I'm cutting on a skew, which uh, I'm slicing rather than cutting, <clears throat> which makes it easier. There's a little curve in here. Okay, so I'm just going to get rid of the waste section of fretboard I don't need. I'm probably going to cut this down even further later.
Oops. Oh, come on, put it in a vice. Five days you're trying to do things quickly and inevitably, that's a bad idea. <laughs> that, dear viewers, <clears throat> that is the sound of a very blunt saw. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just getting, there's just a very slight lip at the edge here and there was one there as well that I'm just getting rid of. The radius is in and correct. Okay, there are different arguments for the next stage. And uh, if you put the frets in now, it puts pressure on the neck and could cause, cause back bow or uh, twisting and, and stuff like that, potentially. Um, however, and, and some people prefer to carve the neck first and then put the frets in. Putting frets into a, a neck that is already carved is not fun. Uh, so I, yeah, I tend to prefer putting the frets in first and just making sure that I've got a good solid stable piece of wood to start with and that yeah that's what I'm going to show you for now so my fret slots need to be uh, double checked for depth never trust the slotted fretboard is going to be absolutely right when it arrives they are slotted when flat on a machine and uh, once the radius is, radiusing has been done the slot might be too shallow for your fret and you will never get a good, uh, a good fret job. Okay, I'm just eyeballing this. I know how deep or how long the tang of a fret is. I put a piece of tape on the edge of the blade, leaving clear blade and that will be deep enough for the fret to seat properly. And then it's just a case of following the radius. I'm also cutting through my locating pins here. incredibly difficult when you're looking at a, at a, a curved surface that is also uh, wedge shaped. It's very difficult to see whether it's actually twisted or, or straight. Uh, and I think what I've actually got here is this neck has moved a little bit. It has, the, the wood has twisted slightly. I, there you go. And that's what gave me the clue. Because that is supposed to be flat. My bench isn't particularly flat. And it's not flat at all there, actually. There was glue there. But there's a slight rock there, which means that the fret, the neck is slightly twisted. And I actually need to sort that out before I go any further. And this is one of those things that you, you really do need to look out for. And I'm going to finalize the depth of the headstock gain access to my truss rod and then see what happens when I adjust the truss rod. I've got some back bow here, a little bit of back bow here and potentially a little bit of twist as well. And the, the fretboard is the user interface. It is the most important part of, of a guitar. And uh, it needs to be right. So, so let's do that. Now, the, the headstock needs to be 15 millimeters thick. People often ask what I think are or would be an essential toolkit 
for somebody starting out in in guitar building or for that matter actually in in woodworking and something that a lot of people don't ever think about is marking out and measuring and drawing equipment there is a huge huge difference between a good ruler and a cheap one Okay, so I have a nice precise line to follow now. And there's not actually that much material to remove. This is, <laughs> in all seriousness, when I started building guitars, uh, this scared the hell out of me. I couldn't figure out how I would get the, the curve correct and thickness the the neck properly to you know make sure it was nice and accurate. Uh, I thought about putting it over a planar thicknesser and then pulling it back off the blade, which is naughty, um, and uh, hand carving, etc. And in reality, it's it's not actually that scary. As long as you know where you want to be in the end. So there's a curve. On the side. And one on that side. Now, very much depends. Uh, I could hand carve that and just use rasps and files and carve down to the line. Uh, use, well, spoke shaves even would do the job okay. Uh, and I'm tempted to do that just to re reduce the amount of dust I create. But that bobbin sander has excellent dust extraction. I would normally eyeball this. So what I'm going to do is, uh, okay, so the problem is we want to put this through a spindle sander. Imagine that's a spindle. This is a curved shape and I could go through at an angle and sand away at the wrong angle to my fretboard. What I want to do is put a piece of wood on the bottom of the neck here, which just rests on the spindle sander's table and make sure that I'm going in straight and square. And uh, it's fairly, fairly simple. Uh, I'm using a rocking neck wrist to line it up. That's a 90 degree angle. And that there is near as damn it where I need it to be. And uh, Day. There we go. So if I glue a piece of wood like that on here, I won't have a problem. I'll have a nice stable uh, section on which to work. So we'll make that quickly. go from there. But hey. Okay. Let's just double check that. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to be I'm going to be carving this neck later, so I'm not gonna bother I'm not going to bother with the masking tape and super glue or anything like that. I'm just going to skip a step. There we 
we go. Final little check. Let's just have a look. That is near as damn it perfect. All right, so uh, I removed quite a lot of waste. In that area, it's going to be easier to use a plane, actually. So uh, we'll do that. It's cross grain. It's completely cross grained. That's incredibly annoying. Um, this one is at least five or six years old. Is used almost daily and is still sharp and awesome. Do you know what? Work holding is one of the biggest problems with a, that a woodworker has. I have one, two, three, four vices on my bench, and I still want more. Aha, I lost it for a second. Essentially what I've done is I've created a curve here. I've gone down to the line almost on both sides, and then now I need to remove the excess. If it helps, you can put pencil line on it. Okay, so the headstock is now the correct uh, depth, etc. And uh, Just, just double checking where center is. That's about there. So my truss rod, the end of my truss rod is down there somewhere. Uh, I am going to start with a seven mil brad point drill. and then stop because I do not want to run this drill into metal because it is an amazing drill drill bit okay so I now have a hole uh, the center point on the brad helps guide me in And now I can go to a standard twist drill, which isn't going to be totally destroyed. Whoops. There we have it. One truss rod. So the truss rod is a dual action piece of steel, two pieces of steel welded together. And uh, as you tighten a nut at one end, it either tightens or loosens and moves the neck 
uh, simplistically up or down. Which basically gives us uh, some adjustment. <laughs> when you're playing, your strings vibrate, so it's held still at the nut, it's held still at the bridge, and the string vibrates and uh, bounces up and down. And with a guitar, you need a little bit of relief in the neck in order to help the string not buzz. Uh, in other words, not, not bounce on the frets. And uh, yeah, that's what the truss rod is there for. So let's see what's happened. Now it doesn't appear to be twisted actually, which is rather good. What I do have though, is back bow. So I've loosened it back off. Uh, this is a dual action truss rod. It, it, uh, can either compress or whatever the opposite to compress is. I don't know. Uh, it goes both ways. I've put it back into the middle position. I'm going to level the fretboard a little bit. Okay. Now, in order to keep this simple, I haven't built this guitar with the carbon fiber rods that we normally put into necks here. And I'm somewhat regretting that now because essentially what has happened is the neck blank has got a little bit of a curve in it. Um, as we removed the excess material, uh, i.e. cut it out, we've re reduced a little bit of tension and it's gone bing, and uh, it's a little bit more than I want in there at the moment. So while I was telling you just now that I'd like to fret it first and then carve it, actually I'm now worried about even more tension being released as we carve the waist away. So what we're going to do now is carve the neck, release any tension, jiggle it around a bit and see what happens. And then go back and address the fretboard and you know, see what is to be done. So yeah, I suppose it's a good thing um, for, for me to have issues uh, with the timber, etc. during the build, you're able to see how how to fix them, but also what to look for. Okay, so essentially, well, we need to start marking things out, really. Here's the body. I need to know exactly where, oh, actually, would you look at that? That's starting to, uh, starting to come together. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this guitar. Uh, anyway, I've drawn on the back of the neck where the body comes to. You do not want to carve into that at all. And in fact, we're going to leave even more space from there. And uh, at these points, there's going to be, there's going to be a curve coming in. The back of the headstock, we want a, a volute style thing, uh, ending at basically directly behind the nut. Okay. Now, because this is, because this is one of my guitars, I'll probably do something silly on the back of it like that, or I don't know, we'll see. Just make it makes it comfortable. Okay. 
Now, I, I often use angle grinders. So we've got a, a sanding disc, normally used in welding. Angle grinder, cut it away and you sort it. Uh, I'm gonna do something a little bit different this time. Uh, another option actually could be spoke shapes quite easily. Uh, that takes a long time and is physical, and it's far too hot to get physical right now. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to carve the basic shape I want at the nut and at the 12th fret. And I'm going to do that with, with rasps, etc. And then I'm going to hog the material away using the oscillating spindle sander. And uh, we should end up, if you join that curve and that curve with a straight line, you'll end up with a good neck. And uh, we'll be sorted. So I need to have a quick look. This should be 20, yep, 25 and a half mil there. I want it to be down to about 21 uh, at the nut and then 20, 23, 24 at the 12th. And again, because this is my guitar, and because I like experimenting, and because it doesn't affect you in the slightest, I'm probably going to go uh, asymmetrical, and uh, because it makes it more comfortable. Uh, in other words, I'm going to carve slightly fatter. So instead of the, the thickest section of the neck being down the center, and it being symmetrical, the thickest section is going to be offset uh, to one side and that fits the shape of my hand a little bit better. Uh, anyway, now, <coughs> in the vise. Okay, if you take the edges off, but don't go right down to the fretboard, gives you a smaller section in the middle. And that we can then remove and, uh, and measure more easily than if it was just a big, long, flat, big, wide, flat surface. I'm fairly happy with where that is. So, uh, essentially, I now need to try and visualize the shape that I actually want as it moves down the neck. Just slightly, just slightly off center, but uh, not that you'd see. Next up, we move to roughly around the 12th fret. which is there. And uh, it's the exact same process. Now, if it helps, what you can do is get a piece of cardboard, draw, draw your neck onto it, so let's pretend this is a piece of paper. Mark out your fretboard and then work out the exact shape that you require. Cut that out and have a template to work to. And uh, there is a very strong argument for doing that uh, for, your first, uh, for your first few builds. And uh, there are useful printouts that you can find on the web to help you with various different shapes. Uh, but anyway, I'm happy with this one. And it is now time to, it's now time to remove some waste. And uh, yeah, I, I could, we could definitely go uh, use, for example, the block plane. Uh, where is that? There we go. Hidden with all the other planes. We could have a fairly good go and get 
a rather large chunk of material uh, removed using that. I have used spoke shaves a lot. The problem with spoke shaves is they have a very small sole. And uh, what we really want is a straight line between this point and this point. You don't want a curve. Spoke shaves tend to create a curve. So, yeah, you need to avoid that if you possibly can. I do make some pretty shavings there. However, I want to see what it's like removing waste with the uh, oscillating spindle sander. Okay, what I'm going to do is basically hog the material away, hold the, the neck at an angle, and uh, remove as much material as I need to, and hopefully not more. Uh, and a way to make that easier is to segment the neck down. So, for example, uh, I'm running my finger along the edge, holding the pencil solid, so I've got a straight line down the edge. I want to take that corner off. And as long as I don't go outside of the lines, I'll be okay. Uh, I want to take a slightly larger corner off the other side, but I'm going to do this in, in parts. So let's mark those two. And we want to get rid of that. Let the fun begin. Okay, uh, turns out that uh, the second method I used actually works out better. So take a section down to both lines and then move on to the next section rather than trying to do the whole thing in one shot. Um, I've now got, well, we now have a, a guitar neck, really. Uh, it's just a question of carrying on down the lines. Uh, so the next stage, uh, if you're doing the marking out, I would use a line just away from the fretboard. You don't want to go right up to the fretboard. Leave that for the hand sanding later. That is um, as close as you want to go, so one, one and a half millimeters away. Uh, and if I join those two lines, that's a very small amount of material removed. And you incrementally get down to a point where you're using smaller and smaller sections and removing less and less waste and you're sorted. Um, now the other option or the other thing that I need to mark out while we're here is the depth. So right there and basically that there if I take this whole section away, down to that line and down to that line, we should have a nice straight flat uh, back of the neck at the correct depth. There are other options. You could create, you could clamp your guitar, clamp your neck down to the bench carefully because you don't want to introduce tension and build a router sled and use the router as a thicknesser. Uh, when it works, that works really well. When it goes wrong, it is catastrophic. Uh, personally, I prefer being in physical control of the tool or the machine, uh, be it an angle grinder or a, a plane or a chisel or rasps, uh, or actually a spindle sander. So, there we go. <laughs> I'm now going to clean it all up uh, using the Japanese saw rasp. First of all, I want to get the uh, 
I want to get the back perfectly level. Feel it with your fingers, you'd be able to feel bumps and waves and things. And then if you hold it up against the light or any background, you can actually see uh, if there are any issues. This is both a long process and it can be somewhat cathartic and therapeutic and all of those icks. But um, yeah, you, you can't afford to skimp on the time required to do this properly. Whatever you do, make sure you've got the scratches of the uh, coarser grits out before you move on. Uh, otherwise you will be in trouble. Okay, I'm going to drill the uh, tuna holes and uh, yeah, make sure that's done. So these are the holes that were drilled through from the template. I'm just going to go right out the back. Best practices. Fine. I'll do it properly. If you're drilling out the back, it is going to want to chip out. Now, I know that this two mil hole is going to be then drilled out with a 10 mil hole. So there's very little chance of me popping out a larger than 10 mil section. But if you put the guitar, if you put whatever you're drilling through on a backing and hold it down, you shouldn't have any chip at all. Okay, like so. Now, to be absolutely paranoid, what I'm gonna do is drill from both sides with a, a very, very good quality um, brad point. So I'll go a little the way in. Often you'll see handmade guitars where this has gone wrong and you've chipped out and it just, it's hard to repair properly. Ooh, that was scary. Let's do it down here. And there you go. There is one other uh, tool that you could get that does make this rather easy. And that is a step drill. Uh, drill down to 10 mil from both sides. And then you will end, basically have an eight mil section in the middle that you take out with a, a twist drill. And that is also a fairly safe way of doing it without chip out. Top tip. Okay. Well, back to the joys of sanding. <sighs> I 
there we go. So, fine sanded, quite comfortably shaped, and uh, there are no hard edges, especially if you're going to have something with lacquer, you don't want any 90 degree corners. That's where the lacquer will break. Uh, the only edge that, I, that I've left unsanded is the front of the fretboard because we are going to be working on that still a little bit. Doesn't appear to have uh, moved any more and I'm quite happy with how that's, uh, that's working out. Um, the next task, the next task is actually going to be uh, the logo. There we go. So that line there is roughly where my string is going to be. So the logo is in line with the string and doesn't look out of place. Uh, now, because of the because of the type of finish that I've just decided we're going to use on this neck. The inlay doesn't have to be inlaid absolutely perfectly. Uh, as I'm talking, I'm actually changing my mind. It's my prerogative. It's a crazy tattooed man. Okay. So there we go. Take whatever you're gonna inlay draw around it, or scribe around it at least. Uh, I, have, I have the line that I've scribed and I'm making a cut to meet up with that line. And then I'll excavate the, uh, the bottom of the cavity to uh, make it flatter. Sycamore is actually working rather well. Just remembered actually there is a second logo. And there is something else to inlay. And that's the little crimson disc. I suppose we'll put it there. So need to go and find a drill bit and do that. Okay, now the fun truly begins. This, this finish is sort of half roasting the neck. Uh, roasted wood is where you take a piece of wood, put it in a vacuum and then cook it slowly and it's uh, kind of like kiln drying but uh, on speed and uh, you end up with a, a torrified what's well, also called torrified um, golden syrupy smelling beautiful light stable timber and this is kind of the poor man's version of that uh, and we mainly do it for the look and I particularly like the feel there we go. Okay, so the reason I'm the reason I'm doing this is because of that mark there. It's a an inclusion in the wood that we just can't, couldn't see. 
and uh, I don't like the look of it. So you take some fire and very rapidly remove the combustibles from behind the fire without spending too much time in any one, in any one place. I try and get a fairly even burn. And that's warm, but not hot. Now we've got a glue joint here. It's gonna open just a fraction of a crack along the length of the fretboard. I'm not worried about that. The main joint is fairly large and it'll be fine. And this wonderfully brings out the flame. <laughs> the flame in the flamed maple, that is. I can't believe I laughed at that. Okay. I need two hands really. I don't want to put this down because it's such a, an annoying thing to light. There we go. Now, if you're going to try this with a standard um, blowtorch. <sighs> Test it first. This is burning very hot, which means it's burning the wood very, very quickly. If you do it with a standard blowtorch, it actually takes quite a long time to get up to temperature. And as a result of that, it burns the, it heats the entire neck up a lot more than otherwise would have been the case. Stuff's going a little bit more extreme. And there we go. All right, so this is now actually still quite warm. As I said, we've opened up just a little bit of a line along there, the glue line, but that's, uh, that's not an issue whatsoever. Now, highly flammable mat back in, back in play. Now, because I sanded this down to 320, that's uh, European grade, it's pretty fine. Uh, I started with a very good finish. And uh, I'm back at 320 now. I should probably give it five minutes to cool down, but I'm too excited to show you what's happening. Okay, so this technique isn't really anything new. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's a Japanese technique for preserving, for preserving wood, and they build houses with this. In fact, I drove past one the other day in the UK. Uh, it solidifies the timber solidifies, it stabilizes it, gets rid of uh, moisture that's not re uh, required really, and uh, makes it more waterproof and uh, stable.
Now I can still see where that original inclusion was and in fact that's now a hole which I'm going to fill with some ebony, uh, ebony dust and glue in a minute. Maybe some charcoal dust seeing as I have so much of that around now. Okay, so guitar-wise, uh, well, we have jumped a few steps. We're supposed to do the side dots first, and uh, I'm just trying to figure out how much the neck has moved again due to the heat, and it's. Uh, there's a bit of a curve in it, so I'm going to have to uh, have to address that uh, in the fretboard in a minute. All right, while the neck is cooling down and possibly moving some more, I'm going to mark out the side dots, and uh, it's very much well. It's it's just a case of knowing where they need to be. One, two, three. So three, five, seven, nine. 12, etc. Brad will mark the positions. And then after you've poked the holes out and you can't do anything about it, you then trip quadruple check. because you just have to. Okay, I'm gonna be using some hollow aluminium tube. It's two and a half mil. And it's just a case of drilling a nice little hole with a good quality Brad Point bit. I don't want to blob super glue all over the place, especially since we've already got a finish we quite like. So I find a little area near me, put the super glue down there, dip the inlay in that, and then get that in place, making as little mess as possible. And, uh, and repeat. So I'm doing this at a slight angle so that uh, I don't actually touch, ooh, I don't actually touch this fretboard's decided to disintegrate just a little bit there, which surprises me. That's not supposed to happen. If you've watched any of our uh, videos, you'll know that one of the things that I say quite a lot is uh, the difference between a, a hobbyist and a professional uh, guitar builder and woodworker actually, in fact I've probably stolen this from some famous woodworker, is uh, the ability to hide one's mistakes or recover from one's mistakes as they happen. Because wood in particular just throws things at you. And uh, anyway, often super glue is the secret. I'm using my thumb as a depth gauge. So I'm just using my strop 
to polish this logo up a little bit. Because shiny is nice. a little bit too much in there, which is often the case. The neck hasn't moved uh, in a negative way. It's, it's sort of straightened itself out a little bit, which is nice. And uh, I do need to remove just a little bit of material around about the middle to uh, give me enough relief as I'm playing. So what I'm gonna do is uh, clamp it to the bench. The plane took off a chunk of material, which is good. I'm now going to use a long radius block to see if we can get any better. So I haven't put that under huge amounts of tension because I don't want to cause a dip. Uh, also, I am only really wanting to work on one section of this neck. So where I'm putting my pressure is up at this end. Whoops. We have a little bit of fall away here, which is uh, actually what we want. And uh, this neck is pretty much, pretty much ready for fretting. So let's get on with that then. So, leveling beam, not too much pressure. over to a finer, a finer grade paper. Okay, so this is level and straight and flat and flush and very sexy. Zeracote is a rather nice word. Uh, I'm just going to hit it by hand with 400 grit, wet and dry. This is the sort of final finish really. And what I do here is going to be felt by the player, i.e. me, until and unless the uh, fretboard is ever refretted, which hopefully it won't need to be done, won't need to be for, for years. So I've got a 12, let's put it that way, 12 inch radius on this fretboard and uh, I want to bend my frets so that they are a tighter radius than that. This is the crimson fret bending jig, fret radiusing jig. That there is pretty much exactly 12. And would do the job okay.
before we go any further, get a fine triangular file, a saw sharpening file would be perfect. And just chamfer over the edges of the fretboard. This guides the fret in, making the whole process easier and more accurate. And uh, also, at some point, it is probable that the guitar will need to be refretted. And uh, doing this helps avoid, or sort of helps mitigate, tear out. Okay, a couple of bits of wood uh, underneath the mat just to support the neck and uh, the mat's going to take some of the pressure. Because it's already carved, it's going to twist and bend and move around a little bit. But that is, uh, that is the nature of the beast, really. Now, I could cut each fret individually to length and then tap them all in. And uh, I have made multiple tutorials uh, on d the different methods available. Uh, this. This actually really appeals to me. Yeah, so this is a, a Crimson Dead Blow Hammer. Uh, It was, uh, this was uh, Pumel Sapiti, so that's one of the other, uh, I built a guitar in nine hours in that timber and uh, in the process I got a hammer, uh, but anyway. The frets are in, the neck is straight. The frets are in, the necks are straight. I sound like something out of Dr. Seuss. Uh, okay, so recap. I've done nothing on the body today at all. We've carved the neck, we've fretted it, we've fixed a few issues. The fretboard is a little bit splintery, which is interesting. Zero Koto, first time I've used it. Uh, I have uh, burnt the neck and then sanded it back and we're quite happy with the finish. Done some inlay and the frets are in. And the neck is straight. So uh, essentially we're on the home straight. Now tomorrow is day four. Tomorrow we have to, have to have the entire guitar under finish and uh, by the end of tomorrow it has to be, you know, finished really. So uh, we will be using the Crimson Guitar Finishing Oil and applying that liberally. Uh, I have got to finish the fretwork as well, uh, do the fret ends, fret level, fret dress, crown polish, all of that. And uh, maybe, possibly, start installing some hardware. I'm quite happy. So essentially, we're, we're roughly 15 hours in. Let's, let's say, in between everything else that's going on. That's about 15 hours of guitar there. Not bad. Uh, I hope you're following along, and uh, I hope that it's going well for you. And uh, we will be back with day four soon. Thanks for watching. Click like and subscribe. Share with all of your friends. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Goodbye.